Hello and welcome to O Worm. Today we'll be taking a look at the anatomy of a grasshopper. Grasshoppers are arthropods, which means they have several key characteristics. Jointed appendages, a hard exoskeleton, and a segmented body. Jointed appendages check, a hard exoskeleton check, and a segmented body check. The grasshopper has three body segments, or sections, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. You can tell whether a grasshopper is male or female by looking at the end of the abdomen. Females have a pointed structure called the ovipositor, which it lays eggs with. Males do not, so this would be a female grasshopper. Now, grasshoppers don't believe in false advertising. They do exactly what you'd expect them to. They hop from grass to grass. To do this, they need some real solid tools. First of all, you can see that they have long hind legs. These legs are modified to help the grasshopper jump long distances. This part is called the femur, and this part is called the tibia. You can see the legs are bulkier here. This means that there's smooth muscle here for extra strength. The tibia also has little hooks on it that form a kind of comb. The grasshopper uses this to grab onto stalks of grass to launch itself and also to make sounds for communication. It runs the hooks alongside the edge of its wings right here. Think of running a comb along the edge of your desk. Very annoying to your roommates, but to a grasshopper, that's love. Or more specifically, a mating song. The grasshopper also has wings to help prolong its jumps. It has two sets of wings, four in total. The ones on the outside are called the four wings and are heavy and leathery. When I tap it, it's hard. The four wings provide protection for what's underneath, which are these hind wings you can see right here. The hind wings are large and membranous, as you can see, like that. They fold up like an accordion when not in use. The hind wings are the wings actually used for flight. Now I'm going to remove the wings and the legs to get a better look at the body. Make sure to twist them off and don't pull them off in order to not damage the structures within the body. Underneath these wings is the tympanic membrane, which functions like an eardrum, collecting and amplifying sounds for the grasshopper to hear. However, because the grasshopper's auditory organs are so simple, they can detect differences in intensity and rhythm, but not in pitch. This is good news for the grasshoppers that can't carry a tune. Their crush won't be able to tell the difference anyway. Now, along the abdomen, you might be able to see these tiny holes one in each segment. These are called spiracles, and that's where air enters the grasshopper's body for gas exchange. So grasshoppers don't breathe through their mouth, they breathe through these little holes. This means that if you are planning to drown a local grasshopper by putting its head underwater, you might want to rethink your strategy. Otherwise, it will survive and get revenge. And unlike the grasshopper, you will drown when your head is underwater. Grasshoppers reject multitasking. They find it much more efficient to tell each body segment to do one job, and do it well. For example, most of the sensory organs on the grasshopper are concentrated in its head, its eye, its antennae, its mouth, and so on. This is actually part of an evolutionary trend called cephalization, where sense organs become concentrated at the anterior end of the body, the animal's head. The thorax, on the other hand, is specialized for movement. That's where all the legs and wings were. So here is the grasshopper's eye. Grasshoppers, like all insects, have compound eyes, which means they have hundreds of tiny hexagonal lenses instead of a single eyeball like we do. This makes their vision look kind of like a kaleidoscope, or mosaic. Compound eyes have their benefits and drawbacks. 
They result in poor image resolution, but allow for a very large range of vision and the ability to detect fast movement. This is important for a grasshopper who really wants to avoid getting eaten. It's harder for predators to sneak up on them, and the grasshopper is alerted quickly when the predator goes in for the strike. The first thing we'll do is to dissect and take a look at the mouth parts. I'll take them out one by one and explain its function. This is the labrum, which is basically a front lip. So there we go, that's the labrum. Behind the labrum are the mandibles, which have overlapping edges that cut like scissors and allow the grasshopper to chew. There's one on each side. The mandibles are very durable. They're so durable, in fact, that they can survive the digestive tract of a burrowing owl. You can tell the number of grasshoppers that perished in the stomach of an owl by counting the number of mandibles in the pellet of the undigested material it coughs up. If there's a hundred mandibles, that's 50 grasshoppers that never got to make peace with the terror of being alive. Below the mandibles are the maxillae. There's one on each side. So here's our maxillae, and the maxillae help manipulate the move to food with, interestingly, fork and spoon shaped structures. Grasshoppers use silverware, who would have thought? I'm just going to take out the other pair of maxillae. Between the two maxillae is the hypopharynx, which you can see right here, and it's a fleshy, tongue-like structure. And bringing up the back is the labium, which you can see right here, and it functions as a back lip. So I've laid out all the mouth parts here. Labrum, mandibles, maxillae, hypopharynx, and labium. Now I'm going to cut open the exoskeleton, being careful to cut only through the top layers and not to damage the structures inside. And now I'm just going to pin the grasshopper down. Now that it's opened up, you can see these fibers connecting the exoskeleton to the internal organs. These are the tracheal tubes, and they connect to the spheres we saw earlier, bringing oxygen into the grasshopper's body. These flaps are the muscles, and you can see that they're concentrated in the thorax because that's where a lot of the movement takes place, with the wings and the legs. Going through the digestive system, here's the crop, which stores the food, the gizzard, which mashes it up, the stomach, which mashes it up but with acid this time, and the intestine, which soaks up all the good stuff, aka absorbs the nutrients. This curious structure here is called the gastric cica, and they're found in insects. There are these finger-like projections in between the gizzard and the stomach, and they help digestion by increasing the surface area of the digestive tract. This helps the grasshopper increase both digestive enzyme secretion and nutrient absorption. Down here are the Malphigian tubules, which just looks like a mass of fibers. This is basically the sex kidney. It filters waste and regulates the osmolarity of the hemolymph. Speaking of hemolymph, the reason you don't see any blood vessels in the grasshopper is because insects have something called an open circulatory system. It's similar to our closed circulatory system, but with a lot less oversight in my opinion. 
Instead of blood circulating within closed blood vessels, grasshoppers have a fluid called hemolymph that fills the spaces between organs and just flows around the body, helped along by the heart, which has valve openings to let the hemolymph in and out. The heart runs along the dorsal side of the grasshopper, and it's hard to see. Let me see if I can find it. Nope, don't see it. You might be able to find the ventral nerve cord along the belly if I move everything aside, but only in a very well-preserved organism. If you can't see the ventral nerve cord, that's okay. Failure is frequent and it's inevitable. Well, looks like no ventral nerve cord today either. Right, that's the end of our grasshopper dissection. Thanks for saying, folks. A fun fact about grasshopper is to send you on your way. It's a bird, it's a plane. It's a swarm of millions of fast-moving desert locusts that are blacking out the sky. Some species of grasshoppers can gather in terrifying swarms of biblical proportions. If you see one, ignore the urge to flee. Fight back, you can be a swarm too. If you like this video, feel free to subscribe because there's lots more to come.